one of the things that's really important for your listeners to hear is that the net zero economy is already here. It's not something that's coming in a few years or in 10 years or 20 years. We're, we're already seeing the change. So in terms of sustainability, we, we definitely see the move away from fossil fuels as a traditional energy source and moving towards more of the net zero technologies as the new economy. Hello, welcome to the Ecopolitics podcast, mini season three, everyday ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the key questions and challenges in the field of environmental politics today. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, and my co-host for the show, Dr. Ryan Katzrozine, is here as well. How's it going, Ryan? I'm good. Thanks, Peter. I'm ready to talk about just transition. Great, because that's what we're talking about today. What does a just transition away from fossil fuels really mean in theory, policy, and practice? To give you some context, it's clear that governments are becoming more attuned to the urgency of the climate crisis and the need to quickly get beyond our dependence on fossil fuels as our primary energy source. These governments have increasingly embraced the term just transition, which for them mostly speaks to the supports they will be offering communities reliant on the fossil fuel sector. In the U.S., for example, President Biden recently signed an executive order setting up a working group to consider the economic needs of, quote, coal, oil, gas, and power plant communities, unquote, as the country and the rest of the world, for that matter, seeks to reduce consumption of coal, oil, and gas. Here in Canada, the Trudeau government also recently set up a just transition advisory body with similar goals in mind, to think about what kinds of support folks in areas of the country dependent on the fossil fuel sector will need to move forward in the context of a net zero greenhouse gas economy. In today's episode, we're interested in learning more about what this just transition means for folks on the ground, those who are advocating for, planning for, and helping to define this idea of a just transition in their everyday work. So, uh, Ryan, for this episode, you went out and spoke to two people who are closely involved in the praxis of just transition. So uh, let's find out who you spoke with. So my name is Luisa da Silva, and I'm the executive director of Iron and Earth. Well, that was a short clip, but as you heard, that's Luisa da Silva, and she was my first interviewee for this episode. And here she provides a little bit more of a background on how she became the executive director of Iron and Earth. So I am a geoscientist by trade, and I started my career in the oil sands of Alberta on SAG-D, which is Steam Assisted Gravity Drainage uh, Winter Exploration Drilling Programs. Um, they were seasonal. Uh, you know, they were always limited by the caribou runs. Um, and, and there I met so many fellow uh, fossil fuel workers right from all over Canada. And... And it was the same story for me. I was somebody who perhaps wanted to work in a different industry, but uh, at the time, um, you know, the oil sands was where a lot of the hiring was happening for people with my skill set. So from there, I, I ended up uh, working uh, internationally, actually, um, in many exploration and mining projects. And about seven, eight years ago, I, I decided, you know, I, I'd like to do something different. And, and I'd like to do something more on, on the, you know, sustainability side of things. And so I, I transitioned my career, which was, you know, it took a few years to, to do the transition fully. And, and in that transition, I explored different paths from working in education to working in conservancy. So when I, you know, discovered Iron and Earth, I knew that it was something that I wanted to be a part of. So we're getting some hints here from Louisa about what Iron and Earth as an organization does, and I'm sure our listeners are keen to learn a bit more. So what is Iron and Earth, Ryan? Yeah, so fundamentally, it is an organization which was originally founded by oil sands workers who were basically trying to help guide their own workforce towards a just transition. Iron and Earth formed back in 2016 during a downturn in the oil prices uh, worldwide, really. Uh, 
which resulted in over 100,000 people in Canada losing their jobs. So what our founders saw was that, you know, there's a lot of people that have all the technical skills or, or quite a lot of the technical skills that are needed to build the net zero economy. So that's really why Iron and Earth started. It was to be that bridge and build that community between the people that are currently working in fossil fuels um, and who want to work in the net zero economy, but perhaps don't really know how to uh, make that jump. Uh, they're not certain what kind of skills they could potentially have. Um, so that's really why why the organization exists and, and why it started. Well, that's really neat to hear uh, from Louisa. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing more about what Iron and Earth do as we go along. Who else did you speak to for this episode, Ryan? So my other interviewee for this episode was uh, an Indigenous rights and climate activist named Heather Milton Lightning. And she actually took part in our interview from Glasgow, Scotland, where she was participating in the recent uh, UNFCCC COP26 meeting. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Milton Lightning. I am from Treaty 4, uh, which is southern Alberta, southern Saskatchewan, and southern Manitoba. So a little chunk of each province and then the southern part of Saskatchewan. I'm four different tribes. I'm Cree. Blackfoot, Ojibwe, and Lakota, and part Welsh. And I'm from, I'm registered to a community called Pasqua First Nation, um, which is probably about 45 to an hour from Regina in Saskatchewan. Interesting. So Heather just explained where she's from and a bit about her heritage. How did she get involved in a just transition, Ryan? Well, she does a, a better job of explaining it, so I'll just play this clip. So my background is working around Indigenous rights in the U.S. and Canada and North America and, of course, globally, because I'm at the COP right now um, in Scotland. But for a long time, I was the director of the Canadian Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign, and we focused on trying to shut down the tar sands because it's like the world's biggest industrial project and the emissions are crazy and it's just killing the environment, but it's also killing people without any due recourse for the people that live there or for the environment. So it was a really challenging job. And I think the thing that it really stood out for me, being from the community that I'm from, you know, my community and several in the surrounding area have signed deals with Enbridge, TransCanada, and for other kinds of development projects. And it's really frustrating because a lot of our people really um, believe in economic development as a way out of poverty. So like poverty alleviation. I think the challenge, though, is like really trying to think about um, the impact, but also the moral impetus. Like if we're signing um, agreements with these companies, but they're violating human rights of other Indigenous people and their rights, and we're helping destroy the land, then that doesn't seem like a good choice in terms of the things that we could be invested in. Okay, so we've got Heather, an Indigenous rights and climate activist who has been intimately involved in anti-Tar Sands campaigns and comes from a place where it sounds like Numerous communities have jumped aboard energy development projects. And then we have Louisa, who was previously involved in the oil sands as a geoscientist and now heads up an organization trying to bring about just transition across Canada. Those are two really interesting guests, Ryan, both of whom seem really deep in the praxis of just transition. Yeah, that's that's right, Peter. And you know, that lived experience that they both have with fossil fuel development, albeit in different ways, really shapes how they see the need for just transition. So you'll hear Heather here explaining how environmental degradation associated with development really shapes her own vision of a need for a just economy. So for me, really thinking about just transition is really thinking about like my home. We have the northern part of the Balkan deposit. So there's fracking and oil development in the southern part of Treaty 4. There's coal development. Um, there's industrial farming. I think there's only two lakes that you can actually like drink the water out of that are left in the territory. Um, so there's some pretty severe impacts that we've seen. And we know due to climate change that there's going to be some severe impacts in terms of droughting and access to water in that region. 
And, you know, we're already having crazy weather, um, loss of snowpack. Um, it's just having so many different impacts, but people really aren't seeing it. I think the people that are really seeing are the farmers and the people that are hunters and, you know, gatherers and people that, you know, are connected to the land, which is obviously our folks. And obviously, you know, non-Native folks that farm really understand what's going on in the environment. However, I think the challenge is really thinking about if climate change is coming, we know it's coming and there's impacts, how do we adapt to that? And are there ways to adapt that are just? And can we build the economy that directly mirrors the justice that we want to see in the world? So I think that's those are the reasons why just transition to me is something that I see as a really plausible um, and equitable solution, in particular in Treaty 4 where I'm from. Hmm. I, I get what you mean, Ryan. She's really grounding the need for a just transition in what she is witnessing and the ecological damage associated with a fossil fuel economy in, in her home territories. And what about Louisa? I imagine she has a different experience with that as someone who used to work in the industry. Yeah. So for Louisa, uh, the need for a just transition, I think, is really driven first by the need to get to a net zero economy, which essentially means, you know, we can't really be using fossil fuels for energy. Uh, You know, we may need them elsewhere, but ideally not uh, to burn them for heat or power or transport. But more importantly, I think uh, the need for just transition um, comes from the implications that this technology shift is going to have for those workers who are cur- currently employed in the fossil fuel sector. You know, recall that she was talking about making that transition herself to a different uh, career path. What's unique about Iron and Earth is that we really bring everybody to the table. We bring uh, the workers to the table. We bring the climate uh, people to the table. And we also bring uh, the fossil fuel industries, uh, companies and whatnot to the table. And from that unique perspective, we have conversations, you know, where we can see what it is that we'd like to do going forward and how we'd like Canada to approach its its um, approach to net zero. So we we certainly see that in the future, Fossil fuels will hold a place in our economy. It's just that perhaps it doesn't have to be the place that it's held in the past. Um, It's been a primary uh, source of our energy. And especially now with the way that the economy is is heading, we can see that, you know, the the cost of energy is, is starting to rise. The traditional sources are starting to rise. And yet, you know, solar, the price of solar is coming down. So, it, it would seem to us that, you know, things like the generation of plastic for, you know, the plexiglass that's separating us, uh, you know, during this pandemic and and the syringes that are giving us our vaccines, you know, those kinds of uh, products that originate from fossil fuels will always have a place in our economy. Um, but we certainly advocate at Iron and Earth that the net zero economy is the way to go for our future, for our future of climate change, for our future of having an earth that we can live on, for meeting, uh, you know, 2050 targets to mitigate climate change. And, you know, there is a real urgency to that. And just to emphasize the point, Peter, I'm going to play another clip from my interview with Luisa, where she helps further define just transition around workers and the communities that they support with their livelihoods. For us, um, the just transition is going to really mean that every single worker has a place in the new economy and that nobody gets left behind. We, we don't want to see a repeating of history, you know, where, where other economies um, that did transition. So I'm thinking about, you know, the Atlantic and the, and the fishing industry there where families did get left behind. Right. And people didn't know how to, to make ends meet because when that industry collapsed, there was no industry that took its place. So for us, a just transition means you have to think from the perspective of the worker, the person who has dedicated their entire career to making this their profession. They have a sense of pride and they have a sense of community uh, in the work that they do and in in their fellow colleagues, you know, the, their brothers in arms, so to speak. And and there needs to be a focus on ensuring that that they are not left behind, that their communities are not left behind, and that their families are not left behind. Uh, 
Uh, that's that's helpful, Ryan. It, it's interesting to hear uh, Louisa talking about the sense of camaraderie underpinning the work of uh, Iron and Earth. So to a certain extent, both our guests have been talking about the need to transition our economy away from fossil fuel energy, and Louisa has invoked this idea of justice for the workers and communities that could be left behind in this shift to a new economy. How did Heather talk about the just part of a just transition? Well, I actually asked both guests a variation of this question. You know, why do we need a just transition instead of, say, a clean transition centered around, you know, different energy technologies? And it was really interesting to hear Heather uh, at first really bring it back to having a more just relationship with the planet. Well, I think across the board, there's this general understanding in the world that if we just switch to renewables and we create green jobs, that we'll solve the problem. But no one's really looking at how much it takes to completely switch to electric or completely switch to solar panels or renewable energy. Like there's still a cost. There's fine earth that needs to be used for that silica, other fine elements that need to be mined, et cetera, um, to create this process. And I think we're not really actually talking about severe reductions and actually changing our relationship with the earth. And I think Indigenous people have always been very clear that we've been the leaders of protecting biodiversity. And I think like a good factoid that UNEP puts out there is like 80% of the world's biodiversity exists on lands that are taken care of by Indigenous people. So that, that says, you know, we have a very different relationship than probably the rest of the world does um, to land. And how, not only to land, but how, how development happens um, and how we live our lives. And I think the challenge is really thinking about, are there ways beyond just having jobs? Are there ways to think about, you know, greenifying the economy? That's great. I think all of those are good things. But it also doesn't address inequality, right? And so if we continue to just greenify the existing infrastructures, say, for example, like the energy grid or, you know, just putting solar panels mm -hmm. everywhere that doesn't actually address inequity. It doesn't talk about poverty alleviation. And I mean, on a global scale, I'm not just talking about the North or where I'm from. And I think that's the challenge is like just transition really needs to think about the global footprint as we're moving forward. Interesting. So I'm picking up here a sense that uh, we can't disentangle the just from the transition for Heather. This isn't just about a, a shift in energy technologies. It's a shift in our relations with each other and with the earth. When we're talking about the shift in relations with one another while addressing inequities and poverty, including this idea of a global footprint and the north-south inequities, I hear her speaking about more than just the people currently working in the fossil fuel sector, which is how we framed a just transition off the top of the show. Is that right, Ryan? I think that's right. And, you know, I did ask this question to Luisa as well. And as you might expect, she really focused on the idea of justice for workers. And unlike Heather, I think transition for iron and earth it is indeed primarily about the technological change. And it's the just part that's kind of like an essential component to add in from the point of view of, you know, making sure that the technological change that we do indeed want occurs in a way that is, you know, socially just. This is where people have to remember that workers are at the center of this. So by calling it a just transition rather than a technological transition, the technological transition, that's just, you know, that is the repurposing of the manufacturing facilities. That, that is, you know, the retooling or, or whatnot. But when you're talking about being just, you have to remember that there's people at the center of this, people that have families, people that have communities that are relying on them, you know, for prosperity and whatnot. When I was working in the oil sands, there was a large portion of my colleagues that would come over from Atlantic Canada, right? And they would work in the oil sands for a few months out of the year. And then that was sufficient for them to be providing for their families for the rest of the year. So this is what we have to center on. We have to remember that, that the just transition is for the workers. It's not for the companies. It's not for the manufacturing. It's for the workers. It's to make sure that people that have spent their whole life in a career, right, where they're a professional, 
uh, that they can take those skills that they have and apply that to a new profession where they will be welcomed into the new economy, where they will feel like they have a place in that new economy. Okay, so Ryan, we're starting to see a little bit of divergence between uh, Louisa's and Heather's interpretations and definitions of what a successful just transition would look like. Louisa is focused very much on the workers who have to move from one form of the economy to the next. And Heather seems to have a much bigger picture of ecological justice in mind, it seems to me. Were there other areas where you saw differences in how these two framed the discussion? Well, I think one interesting thing that I noted was the different ways that they referred to the idea of net zero. Um, You know, and maybe this just kind of uh, gets at their their different foundations for how they're approaching the, the topic. But as you heard at the outset of the show, a net zero economy is really kind of central to Luisa's lexicon. And in a way, it's the goal that iron and earth is really working towards. And it came up quite often in our interview. A lot of these workers already have the base skills that are needed to work in the net zero economy. And there's just, you know, a bit of a gap in knowledge for how to translate what it is that they're currently doing in the fossil fuel industry into what they would be doing in the net zero economy. And what Iron and Earth does is we've developed a a series of 10 day uh, training courses, which is uh, five days in class and five days hands on um, to help these kinds of uh, workers to be able to successfully uh, make that transition. Interestingly, uh, Heather kind of conveyed quite a bit of skepticism about net zero, kind of in the same vein that, you know, we've heard people like Greta Thunberg criticize the concept. And in particular, because this idea of net zero has been co-opted by large corporations uh, to kind of suit their own purposes. It's difficult in these spaces, particularly at the climate negotiations, where we're seeing, you know, businesses and big corporations in cahoots with a lot of the countries in terms of pushing um, particular policies forward. And, and also talking about this idea of net zero, which actually doesn't solve the problem. And I think that's always the challenge I felt about like the more environmentally friendly economics where we price nature. It's not good enough to price nature. To me, nature is priceless. What we really need to think about is a, an, a whole evolution in terms of our relationship to the land across the globe. That is a a really interesting divergence that we found here. And and I think it is related to their different work backgrounds. You know, uh, Louisa worked in the oil patch and uh, Heather, frankly, campaigned against it and thus remains pretty skeptical of the claims of companies who now say that they're embracing these net zero goals. This all makes me wonder, Ryan, how our guests looked at the challenge of convincing their own skeptics. They both work on Alberta-centered campaigns organized around the oil sands. And we know there is quite a lot of public support for the oil and gas sector in that province and and across the country, really. And I would wager quite a lot of resistance to the idea of a just transition. You know, people saying that's probably a lot of smoke and mirrors and won't necessarily result in feeding families in the same way that the oil and gas sector does right now. What did they have to say about that? So I asked uh, Luisa about how to convince the staunch pro-oil crowd in Alberta and, you know, about the need for just transition. This subset of Canadians or Albertans who are supporters of the, the I Heart oil and gas campaign, so, you know, how do you get them on board the just transition band- bandwagon? And in a way, she said it's about refocusing the broader community's sense of pride from being centered around one type of of commodity economy to another? Not sure that it's a subset. I think that most Albertans feel quite proud of that industry. And it's not because it's the resource. It's not the oil and it's not the gas that they love. They're not petroleum crazy. It's more about the fact that this is the thing that has united the entire province, right? Everybody in Alberta know somebody or has somebody in their family or they themselves have worked in this industry at some point in time. Think about the person that works at Tim Hortons in Fort McMurray, right? When if the the oil sands there completely closed down, that 
person at Tim Hortons is also going to lose their job because then the entire economy suffers. So it's that sense of community again. It's the sense of community that, that this has been the thing that has linked everybody together to having a common understanding of each other, right? They, they, when you have family or when you have people from your community that are working in the same sector and especially the nature of this sector where it is fly in, fly out, you're living at the project, you are with your coworkers, you know, for 12 hours a day, seven days a week for four weeks on or, or something like that. It's you, you do develop a very strong sense of community. And so I think from that perspective, um, it, it's quite easy for people to see that if you have that sense of community now in the fossil fuels, you'll have that sense of community again in the net zero industry because you'll be the person working on the solar projects alongside with your other colleagues that are working on these solar projects, or you'll be working on the wind projects or the geothermal or the hydrogen plant or any of the number of net zero um, solutions that are out there. That's where your sense of community will now come from as well. And so rather than Alberta collectively saying, hey, my cousin or my uncle or my neighbor works in oil and gas, they'll be collectively saying instead, you know, my neighbor works in the net zero economy. I know somebody who's doing a solar install. My son over there is putting in wind turbines. I think that's what the narrative will change to. So that's what Luisa had to say on the matter of convincing skeptics. But Heather really took this in a totally different direction. She was answering, I think, from the point of view of Indigenous communities embarking on just transition and basically saying, you know, we need to show compelling results so that people see the power of just transition with their own eyes. Knowing my own people, um, we really need to see something. And when I mean that, like, I can talk to you till I'm blue in the face about a theory or about an idea or about a story, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not till I see it in practical application in real life. Am I going to believe what you're saying? And that's nothing against anybody. I think most people like to see that in terms of logic. Like, I'll really like your theoretical idea, but I won't really buy into it 100% until I see that it works. And I think that's the challenge with just transition is that we really need to think about, like, what are the models that are, are being used out there that are doing really amazing things in different communities that we could showcase to Indigenous people that we could try? And I think, you know, the other aspect to this is basically trying out different approaches in different communities and giving communities control over their own destiny. I also think there are different ways to, to meet people where they're at. And I think the other thing goes back to this idea, like we just need to be able to, to work with communities that are down to try this. They're down to, you know, re-envision their future moving forward. I don't expect that everybody and their dog is going to jump on board. I think it's you know, it's like uh, Cowsis. They have one of the biggest solar farms in Treaty 4. That was a partnership with Shell, which I think is really interesting. But they really set the pace for other communities to jump onto the idea of, of building wind and solar projects in their communities and, you know, ha having energy, energy sovereignty. And I think that's huge. So it kind of takes somebody out there being a trendsetter for other communities to look at and say, those projects work really well. We want something like that for our community. That's really neat, Ryan. Um, our guests did take your question in two very different directions, uh, but both with this idea of convincing others in, in different ways. And yet I was struck by how central this idea of community was to both of their visions. It really seems like just transition for both Louisa and Heather is about building capacity and resilience at the community level, albeit maybe for slightly different reasons. So Ryan, in some of Heather's clips that you've been playing, she's hinted at the importance of taking an indigenous centered view of just transition in her work. I'm wondering if we can take a few minutes to hear a little more about that. In some of our previous uh, episodes in both season one and two, we've been learning about indigenous knowledges and how indigenous worldviews and concepts can change how we understand eco-political problems. In what way did Heather apply an indigenous perspective to just transition? 
That's a really great question, Peter. I think Heather would agree with me when I say that it, it really defined the entire foundation for how to think of just transition in terms of you know, the how, the why, and the what of just transition. So I have a couple of clips I'm going to play for you on this front, uh, starting with this one. When I think about being an Indigenous person, we're taught to think seven generations ahead of ourselves. And really thinking about my own ancestors, they definitely did that. When they signed treaties, they were done not in English. They didn't understand what was being signed. But somehow they managed to encapsulate education and healthcare and all of these different things into our treaty rights without even speaking the language that we were signing those documents in. And so it's with that thinking, again, um, looking to the future. And I really believe that, you know, we have to dream and we have to vision about the world we really want to see in the future and work towards it. So you're hearing there, uh, you know, one theme that came up a lot in our discussion, this idea of looking ahead beyond our current interests um, or even those of our own children. You know, it's, it's uh, interesting to me that in Western knowledge systems, uh, there's this focus on on the next generation, right? And speaking of Heather, really kind of juxtaposed uh, that with a kind of temporal difference there in terms of, you know, how these different sets of knowledges confront the actual time frame of the ecological crisis that we face right now. And so I'm going to play another clip here where, uh, you know, where she also makes this point, but I also play it because I think it, it helps identify the other things key theme which popped out at me in in discussing an indigenous approach to just transition which is the linkage that um, it has to place and to land and to regional ecologies that's the thing that's really distinct about indigenous people is that our worldview is based on where we come from and how we see the world is based and rooted in, in that structure i don't have this romanticized view that indigenous knowledge is the to end all it's definitely not that but I definitely think there are some really intrinsic things that people need to think about and moving forward in terms of the relationship to the land and how we treat it. And I think, you know, a great example is, is water. Um, where I come from, we don't have a lot of water. There's aquifers underground. A lot of them have been impacted um, by different types of development within the region. But on the other hand, we know that it takes water probably about 3,000 years to naturally purify itself within the Earth's own system. So if we're impacting any source of that water system, it's going to take another 3,000 years for it to be cleaned naturally. And I think that's something that no one thinks about. And yet we've been living in, in Canada and the region that we're from for thousands of years, and we've never destroyed our own water resources. And yet Canada, only being a country of 150 years old, has done that across the board in all kinds of different territories in numerous different ways. Hmm. I, I think I get what you mean, Ryan, about the linkage of knowledge systems to place, to the land and to its natural ecology. And this really does serve as a what seems like a distinct foundation for Heather's understanding of just transition. And I think these quotes help explain why our two guests' interpretation of community, which we discussed a little earlier, are actually quite different, right? For Louisa, the, she centers the discussion on communities of workers who have come together, maybe from different parts of Canada, to work in the oil sands and their needs moving forward. Whereas for Heather, there's this invocation of community as uh, tied to a particular place, you know, to a multi-generational sense of place. Okay, one last segment for this episode, Ryan. I want to just get a bit more of a tangible sense of what just transition looks like on the ground. I guess Heather did mention the example of uh, the community partnering with Shell to bring a large solar farm to Treaty 4 territory. What other tangible examples did you get from the interviewees about what a just transition looks like on the ground? Sure. So one example I got from Luisa when she was talking about one of the key pillars of their just transition plan involved abandoned oil wells in Alberta. Our just uh, transition plan, which we call our prosperous transition plan, uh, outlines the four pillars. We see it from uh, an upskilling perspective, a retooling, a repurposing, and nature-based solutions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the repurposing 
um, because we have right now a project that we do with RenewWell in Tabor, Alberta. And if you can imagine, there's about 170,000 abandoned or orphaned drill wells in Alberta, and this is on disturbed land. Um, so what RenewWell is doing is that they're uh, repurposing that land away from uh, a drill wall and towards a, a solar farm. So it's using the existing infrastructure, the roads and whatnot. And the really great thing about that is that it leaves agricultural land for agricultural purposes. We don't need to be putting solar panels on agricultural land. And this disturbed land can be used for the solar panels. That's a really neat example, Ryan. And I guess uh, one of the benefits there is that in terms of uh, cleaning up and repurposing oil well sites, well, that's familiar territory for some of the oil workers, right? Uh, that's a neat example. So Ryan, just to get back to our season three theme of everyday ecopolitics, did you get any words of wisdom from our guests on how to get involved in supporting a just transition? Well, a couple of things did come up. Uh, for instance, Luisa mentioned the importance of getting involved politically and the idea of sharing your voice with this just transition advisory body, which uh, you mentioned at the outset of the show, um, which is indeed, you know, currently soliciting comment from people across Canada. By putting pressure on the government, individuals can really state, here's what it is that we want to see for our future. The government can then turn around and make that into policy. The government also right now has a just transition uh, coalition happening where they're listening to the voices of the people to hear what it is that, you know, really needs to happen. And I think that that's the right way to do it, but they need to take action afterwards. They need to start putting those policies into place. They need to start putting these incentives into place, the green strings and whatnot, so that there is that motivation to make the change. And for her part, Heather referred to the work of unions and NGOs. Uh, you know, she specifically mentioned the Council of Canadians, all of these uh, organizations that are putting out these excellent resources on just transition. Um, and she also mentioned academic work. You know, she herself is completing a, a graduate degree and she mentioned, you know, there's a growing body of literature out there on just transition to, to uh, brush up on and peruse and, and to contribute to. But uh, this final clip, I think, was offered up more uh, in a personal sense by Heather, you know, kind of hinting at the mindset that really encapsulated her work and serves as a good model for students, I think. So I want to just play this one real quick. Of course, nobody really has a, a complete answer or definition of what just transition is. And I think it's up to communities to really define that for themselves. I want to work with people to learn about it, get excited about it, and perhaps, you know, go on their own and develop some really awesome projects. And that's something that I'd be super excited about. Well, there you have it. Um, those last clips remind me of how Man Vibala in our first episode of the season talked about uh, becoming an eco-citizen as being about learning the skills of a community organizer so that you can work with communities to help them achieve a sustainable future from the bottom up. Isn't it neat, Ryan, to see how these episodes are connecting with one another this season? Yeah, it's been really interesting to see not just across our, uh, this third season, but across all three seasons that we've done. It's been uh, really neat to hear um, you know, common themes uh, and ideas that uh, have stretched across uh, all the different people we've, speak we've spoken to. Um, I want to close, Peter, with one final inspirational thought from Luisa. The only thing that I'd add in is just to let people know that there's a lot of hope right? There's, there's hope that uh, Canada will be making uh, the transition over to net zero. We have a workforce ready and willing to make it happen. Well, that's cool to hear. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn to our listeners now. So get in touch. Let us know what you think on the issues we've been discussing in today's episode. What does a just transition mean to you? And are you involved in any just transition projects in your own community? So make sure to follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP and check out the artwork and additional resources that we put together for each episode at our website, ecopoliticspodcast.ca. This episode was produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning for season three is provided by Ashley Fernall. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. The podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0 Canada.
Thanks for listening.